Welcome, everyone, to the first in a short series of interview-based uh, webinars on aspects of the Zero Trust model for cybersecurity, now the root of a vast overhaul of federal IT security architectures and uh, also influencing security architecture in public clouds and networks and in enterprises large and small. Zero Trust is arguably the future of cybersecurity. These conversations will introduce key people evolving this discipline, look at Zero Trust from a theoretical and implementation perspective, and hopefully provide takeaways meaningful for technology practitioners and executives in charting a Zero Trust future for their organizations. Today, we're going to begin at the beginning with a gentleman who, colloquially speaking anyway, thought up Zero Trust in the first place. John Kindervag is widely recognized as the creator of the Zero Trust model for cybersecurity. First envisioned in the late O's when John was working as VP and principal uh, analyst in risk and security at Forrester Research. He is currently senior VP cybersecurity strategy and a global fellow at uh, Ontuit, a global consulting and management services firm uh, focused on implementing Zero Trust security strategies and more broadly in educating technology leaders about Zero Trust concepts and best practices. Previously, he was field CTO at Palo Alto Networks. In 2021, John was named to the president's NSTAC Zero Trust subcommittee and was a primary author of the NSATC uh, uh, NSTAC Zero Trust Report to the President of the United States, foundational to the current federal Zero Trust architecture program, formally mandated in early 2022. John has been interviewed by major broadcast and print media and speaks frequently at core InfoSec events. Among other encomia, he was named CISO Magazine's 2021 Cybersecurity Person of the Year. Also with us is Jason James, Marantis Director of Security. Jason has worked in the information security realm for over 20 years. His professional background has ranged from military to enterprise cybersecurity as a global CISO. For much of his career, he's focused on GRC, Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance, helping companies become and stay compliant. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, I will now ask questions and hopefully you will answer. <laughs> um, I guess to start, I'd like to set the stage uh, a little bit for attendees and listeners. Before Zero Trust, what were, and I guess maybe still are, the dominant models for cybersecurity and what was and still are wrong and still is, still is wrong with them? Yeah, the, the dominant model for cybersecurity is what we would consider a perimeter-based model. Uh, the idea that you have really just a firewall between your internal network and your external network. And you assume that everything that's on the outside of that, the, the evil internet is bad and everything on the good uh, the internal network is good. And that's where this trust model, the idea that there's a trusted network, we call that the internal network and the untrusted network, the external network. In fact, most firewalls today still come with interfaces labeled trusted and untrusted. Uh, and that's where you plug it in. And that, in, in itself was really the genesis of zero trust because I thought that that was the silliest thing I'd ever heard when I started deploying firewalls, uh, you know, the turn of the last century. So the, so, so you're doing this security work, you're analyzing risks and, and you figure out that this concept is a, you know, is a bad basis for, for making things secure. Can you tell us more about, why trust is is bad? I think you wrote a blog at one point about this. In fact, fairly recently, that got a lot of certainly a lot of likes and clicks. Yeah, I I called it trust as a vulnerability, uh, and so trust is a hard thing to define, right? And it's a human emotion that's been injected into digital systems for no reason at all. You know, we don't know why or when that happened. Uh, you had uh, uh, Ken Thompson. When he won his Turing Award, his speech was called The Problem with Trusting Trust in 1984. In 2000, you had Ross Anderson write The Trusted Computing Fact, where he says that uh, a trusted system is defined in the government, uh, and it's a joke. It's defined as any system that we can, we in the government can break, right? And so, uh, and you can go back to 1958, a guy named Morton Deutsch uh, defined trust as the willingness of one human being to be vulnerable to another. So all that stuff kind of played into it. But in reality, it just, it was like, get rid of trust. Uh, in, the, in these firewall models, 
that you would install. And Jason, Jason and I, by the way, go back to Palo Alto Networks. We, we were colleagues together. And Jason, good to see you. And uh, we, we live very close together. We just, we just had lunch not too long ago. So, uh, but these firewall models, you would have a, an internal interface. It would have the highest trust level, uh, typically 100. The external interface that goes to the internet would have a, a, the lowest possible trust level, which would be zero. And then you would have various other interfaces that would be set up as DMZs or, or other connect, connection points. And they'd be given a number somewhere between zero and 100. And based upon that number, the policy was defined. So the policy uh, would say that if you're going from a high trust level, the internal network, to a low trust level, the internal net, or the external network, you don't need to write a rule. It just automatically can go outbound. And I really bristled at that. I said, well, we need to put rules about what can be allowed to go outbound. Why would we do that? That's We don't care whether things go outbound. And I said, we should, because what if somebody is in here stealing data and they want to exfil it out? Now they don't have any policy stopping them. Well, that would never happen, people would say. And it did happen. And so what the it's very simple what zero trust is. People make way too much out of it. It's every interface should have the same trust level, and that trust level should be zero. We should eliminate the concept of trust from digital systems because it's not needed to move a packet from point A to point B. It's that simple. So is that what you meant in that blog when you said we've confused trust in human beings with trust in packets? Absolutely. People get all the time get in my face. You're saying people aren't trustworthy. No, I'm not. I'm saying people are not packets. No person has never has ever been on a network, right? The idea that John is on the network right now so that we can record uh, this interview. I am not. I'm sitting here in my home in Dallas, Texas. I have not been shrunken down into a subatomic particle where I've been sent over my wireless internet, then onto the backbone of the public internet to get to the Riverside FM server so that you can record this and edit it later. It's never happened to me. Uh, it's happened to no human being ever. It rarely happens in the movies, guys. It happens in Tron, Lawnmower Man, uh, Wreck-It Ralph. But even in the Matrix, they got to plug in, right? So this is the thing. We have to disconnect humanity from technology. That actually makes that makes huge emotional sense. I, this is something that I have been wrestling with, you know, since since reading that blog and since reading a couple of other things that you wrote, where you you talk about Snowden, you talk about Manning, you talk about real situations where where real trust was exploited, you know, by people, and you get into difficult moral issues like betrayal and you know hurt feelings, obviously. Um, and this is not about that sort of thing. This is about moving things to a domain where trust is is absent in effect from measuring behavior so right every packet is treated exactly the same so when you look at the packet you're making a decision should that packet be allowed to access a resource or not it's that simple uh, but you're not giving a packet extra uh extra privileges because it was asserted to come from john right because that's just an assertion the packet, we don't know whether it, who it came from, uh, but it looks like in the header that, that the username John was part of that, but it, it could have been anybody, you know. I once said to somebody uh, in, uh, in one of those types of roles in the government that are kind of, kind of spooky, I said, you know, if, if somebody puts a gun to my head and makes me leave the computer and sits down here and starts typing away, do they, is there a reverse transference of identity? Do they become John because they're on John's computer? And he laughed and he said, oh, yeah, no, not really. But uh, but that does happen a lot more than you would think. And I said, it does not. People don't put a gun to your head and force you to get off your computer. And he says, John, John, John. I remember the way he said it. He said, John, 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 just shaking his head. Yeah, it's a virtual gun, Right. It's a virtual gun. Unless, unless you do the thing that, that I tell you to do, get me this data, do this, do that, mm, bad things are going to happen. And uh, I'm sure Jason, having been in the military and some of that can, can uh, 
Well, he probably can't talk about it, but if he could, he could probably tell some stories. So, so you, so you came to this idea: we eliminate trust. What does that mean in, you know, the highest possible level, technical terms? Still technical terms. It actually doesn't have any effect on technology at all, other than we put much more granular policy uh, about who gets access to a resource. We don't rely on these broken trust models and say, oh, if you can authenticate onto the network, you can have access to everything on the network, right? I remember when the Manning thing broke out, and uh, I, was actually, I was actually in Hong Kong, and people were calling me up and, and asking me, hey, are you going to, to meet with Snowden? Like, how did you find out I was in Hong Kong? What, that was the first question I was kind of concerned about. But, the, but, but I wasn't. I, I, it was just a pre-planned thing. And then I got a call from a guy who uh, was a former prosecutor who was involved in negotiating um, some of the stuff behind the scenes on, on that whole deal. And he said, when is, this first crossed my desk, I asked, how does a private first class in a forward operating base in Iraq have access to classified State Department cables in Washington, D.C.? And he said, it wasn't until that moment that I really understood what you were doing in Zero Trust, because that should have never happened. But the trust model on this network that you hear called the high side or the the secure network or whatever it's called... uh, Yes. And it says if you get access to the network, you get access to everything on the network. And so this is true for Snowden, for Manning, for Texaria, right? That's what they're exploiting, the trust model. Texaria, the, our latest one, the guy was apparently printing off very secure documents, which... You know, when I talk to people who know how these things happen, they're like, how did that even happen? I'm like, I, well, you're asking me, the wrong person. Uh, but then he folds them up and he puts them in his pocket and he takes them home and he t- takes them, takes fit pictures of them at his parents' house. Right. This is stuff that's not supposed to be able to happen. And yet it does happen. And so that's what we have to stop is Texaria shouldn't have out access on that network to that information. And if he would have never had access to that information, he would have never been tempted to print that stuff out in the first place. Hmm. So, so it sounds at a certain level like this is an expression, maybe it's the implementation side of a real version of what we call the principle of least privilege, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when we think about least privilege, because it's been so overused, everybody will tell you they do it, but they don't. My definition of, well, so let's look at it from a different way. Let's look at it from a human way. Um, I, I come home from from work. I sit down on the couch with my wife. I look over and I go, hey, do you know who's that guy getting beer out of the fridge? Right? Now, when she says no, my normal reaction as a human being would be like, get out of my house. But if I'm using the trust model that we have, Today, I would go, oh, you don't know who he is? Well, but he's able to get beer out of the fridge, so therefore he must belong in the house. So I'm going to go strip the bed. Will you bring me the clean sheets for the guest room? That's what we do. See? So it's, it's, it's just completely out of kilter of how we should absolutely respond to the fact that we have no knowledge about certain things. So how do you go about implementing this in the real world? Um, it, it, you know, it, it seems like I see marketing with zero trust all, all over it painted on, but it doesn't <laughs> seem to me like something like this is something that can be purchased from a, from a vendor in the simplest sense that we, you know, we mean that term. You can't get a box filled with zero trust. No, no, you can't get the easy button, right? Uh, got a helicopter going over my head here. Hopefully you, you can't hear that, but I'm just making sure it's not a black one kind of right. hovering outside my window. <laughs> You've said uh, too much. Yeah, but, uh, the, the, you know, you, you use a combination of technology to achieve certain goals. So in Zero Trust, 
And this is documented in the NSTAC report, the presidential commission that I was appointed to. And, and you should share that, uh, you know, and everybody should read that because that is a government document. It's we, we consider it authoritative on what zero trust is. But what you have to do is figure out what you need to protect. That's the first thing you're doing. So you're going through an exercise to define what are known as protect surfaces. We've all heard of the attack surface. Well, I believe in inversion. I invert a lot of things. So what's the inversion of the attack surface? The protect surface. I shrink the attack surface down orders of magnitude to something very small and easily known called a protect surface. So, for example, in, in, in webinars and speeches, I'm often using the example of how the Secret Service protects the president of the United States. Um, I have an image of President Barack Obama's 2009 inauguration parade. Well, inside the, the beast, the, the limousine, there, that, there are four people who connote the pr protect surface or denote. Let me pick that up. Inside the limousine, there are four people that we would say are the protect surface. The president, his wife, and his two children. That's all that matters to the Secret Service. If at the end of the day, those four people are left alive, the Secret Service did their job. And everything is being done beyond, outside from that, because the system is being designed from the inside out, around protecting those four individuals. And so, you know, they'll have... Uh, people who are who are agents walking beside the car. They'll have agents who are in the crowd. They'll you know they actually have snipers on roofs, but they have multiple technology sets that are determined for the purpose of protecting the protect surface: the president, his wife, and his two children. And, and yet, this is not necessarily defense in depth. You're actually just talking about simplifying the problem. Absolutely, because defense in depth, the way we do it, is, is let's take a whole bunch of different technology and throw it around and hopefully hit something, right? So my f former Forrester colleague, Rick Holland, coined the term expense in depth. We spend money we don't have on things we don't need because we don't know what we're supposed to protect in the first place. So maybe we'll just catch the bad stuff. And that doesn't work in real life. We know that. And it increases complexity, right? Everybody says, oh, you need two separate brands of firewall in case one goes down. Well, now I've at least doubled my management complexity. And quite frankly, if one of them goes down, the traffic doesn't route anyway because the people saying that don't understand how a packet moves, right? So we can absolutely, uh, we can absolutely make this work uh, in a more simple way. And we can get the benefits of, say, something like exp ex uh, defense in depth, uh, almost said expense in depth, but the benefits that we wanted, which were we need a firewall and an IPS and, and a URL filter, but we can build that into a single piece of technology now because the CPU speeds are so much faster. We've benefited from Moore's Law. So we don't have to have individual technologies stacked around. Uh, you know, I've got one client that's got 11 hops to the Internet. 11 hops, because they're trying to just, you know, think of everything they can to secure it. And all they get is a horrible user experience and people who hate working there. Hmm. So then it, it, it does sound like you're, you're talking about um, a, lot of, a lot of packet inspection, though. A, a very a very granular perimeter where you can you know where where very smart things are happening at a very granular level on a lot of different places at once isn't that well, what sometimes it means? i'm talking sometimes i'm talking about inspection i'm talking about inspection of the traffic that's allowed but since we don't just allow everything anymore right like we did in the old old days everybody gets to come into the door and try to get to the fridge right we say you got to you got to knock and and then I got to look through the you know the, the it's just like the old speakeasy I got to know who you are before and then you come in and I watch you and once you get in and you get to the fridge I'm gonna are you taking more than one can of beer you know uh, or, or are you taking the special beer that has the label uh, save for you know special people what what are you doing right so I'm I'm not actually 
doing as much to every single packet. I'm making a lot of purposeful decisions to drop a whole lot of packets that I don't need. So you everything not required is forbidden, basically. Yeah, we start with a default deny anyway, right? And so we're going to deny everything, and then we're just going to turn on the things that we need, which is how we do it in real life, right? If I go up to visit Jason, Jason's, you know, a champion barbecuer, by the way. I don't know if you know this about him, but he's a champion barbecuer. Now, someday, I'm assuming he's going to invite me over to have barbecue, right? Instead of just tell me about what great barbecue he makes. But when, when that happens, right, I will, I will come to his house and he will go, oh, you look exactly like you did the last time I met you, so you must be John. Uh, and so, yeah, come on and, uh, you know, here, have a rib. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go all Flintstones, right? But he wouldn't just say to everybody, hey, come in here and have food for free, even if I don't know who you are. If he's going to have a restaurant, he's going to say, come on in, have a seat. Uh, you know, if there's a if there's a table available and here's your check and, and, and you're going to, you know, you're going to pay for it. Right. So there's different ways we give people access to things like a rib. Right. Sometimes you get a rib because you're a friend. Sometimes you get a rib because you pay for it. But but there's a reason behind it. Huh. So so everything happens in context. But because of the the vastly reduced flow of traffic, because of denial, the the number of context based decisions you have to make is limited and you can actually do it. And things end up being simpler and speeding up. I mean, is that the, the basic? Yeah, idea? absolutely. Like, for example, um, you know, in, in our practice, we might define a protect surface, and we know that that the server uh, that that the resource is running on, whether it's in the cloud or whatever, is run, is is a Linux server, right? And so when you look at an attack, and you you look at you know the signature and the strings and all that stuff, you go, oh, that attack is for, you know that threat, that piece of malware is for a Windows system. So automatically, I'm going to drop it into the bit bucket because it could never run there anyway. So why allow it to even go there, right? And then, uh, then we go and we go, or we, we just see that that's the, the, the traffic. It's for Windows. Drop it. Now, say it was for Linux. Now we're going to inspect it because it might be for this Linux server. Oh, inside the payload, there's something to, that's a known attack. We have some sort of signature or something. And so we've inspected that, and now we drop it. Or it, we know it's for, for Linux, and, and we can see that it's going to, to the place where we, it's supposed to go. And we look at it, and it's clean, and it's coming from somebody who's got the rights to access that server. So now we'll let it pass, right? And so <clears throat> we're, we're most of the traffic, uh, well, I mean, there, no, I don't, uh, let me pick that up. We allow a lot of bad traffic to come into our environments because we're afraid we're going to stop good traffic. Right. We're afraid of the false positive. But what I will tell you in my experience in the last decade and and Jason can validate this. We worked at Palo Alto Networks. We didn't see very many uh, false positives because the technology is so much better than it was in the 90s when you had that as a major problem. Right. So a lot of these problems have been solved technologically, but our fears our inbred fears of oh, we don't want to stop an email going to the president because we'll get in trouble. It's better to allow a lot of bad things to come in and we can clean that up. But then, you know, the president will still get his or her email. This is something you've written about elsewhere. I, I, I misremember the details, but I remember you maybe telling us uh, in an earlier conversation about uh, a VP on a software project who had deliberately reduced the protections around some resource, internet exposed resource, maybe it was an Amazon S3 bucket or something like that, because yeah, was. that it person was a, felt it was slowing development down. Yeah, I won't say who that is, although if you know how to search legal documents, <laughs> it's actually in a lawsuit, uh, which is how I found out about it. And so I'm reading the legal documents for this lawsuit for a data breach, and the public was told that there was a misconfiguration of the AWS uh, S3 gateway, 
And then you go into the legal documents and then you find out it was a deliberate configuration to allow anybody who had domain credentials to have access to this resource in order to speed up development. Well, the person who actually downloaded and and stole this data wasn't part of the development team, had no reason to ever have access to that, right? And so we see that all the time. uh, and, And the best way to stop that is to don't give them access. And then if they need it, they'll come They'll come crying about it, right? But Ed Snowden doesn't call up the help desk and say, hey, I was in the middle of downloading this important top secret document that I'm going to give to WikiLeaks. (laughs) And I was suddenly cut off. Yeah, yeah, can I get that (laughs) access restored? No. So, but but that is the fear of, particularly of software developers. I mean, at the end of the day, even if you shed traffic, you're talking about a system that needs to work by being aware of what's legitimate for applications to do and say to one another so that you can reject bad things, right? Um, so, so, so this means that the domain of zero trust overlaps the domain of applications. There's no way for an infrastructure, for example, all by itself to be secure in this sense if applications are going to do bad things. Yeah. Or is that it's not also, true? Is that a misperception? Well, well, to me, I mean, the the thing is, it's it's an open concept, right? Because you, you, we talk about applications and different things, but it actually boils down to all things in cyber, right? I mean, whether it's emails or anything, we we don't want to slow anything down. That's that's a big problem, right? Whether it's just data transfer of a file to somebody, or an email, or like I said, development of application. That's our thing is right because we're trying to get business done, and that's that's where we have to really sit down with our policies and procedures. And the biggest thing that you can do that I would recommend everybody is as a CISO is learn the business that you're protecting because if you learn that, it helps you understand how to secure it better, right? Because that's the thing is that uh, we understand you, the business is to make money and to do everything, but if you don't understand what they do, then you can't protect it itself. Right. And that's just why I see that all the time with people of like, you know, we'll just just leave that app wide open or leave this email junk filter open, do whatever. Right. Leave it open because we've got to get it done. And I'm like, but if you understood the business, you wouldn't even probably needed that. And that's just that's just my take on that one. No, that's the first design principle of zero trust. When you look at the NSTAC report, I talk about the four design principles. Uh, focus on the business outcomes is the first one. Right. And I talk to people all the time. They don't know what their company does. No, I configure firewalls. But what does your company do? Well, we're sort of in manufacturing a little bit. But then we do this other stuff, I think. And I'm not exactly sure. But they don't even know, you know, what they do. Right. And that it's odd. So you'd think you'd know what you did. But, uh, it, you know, that doesn't seem to be always true. So you, you've hit the first design principle. Right. And then you design from the inside out. That's the second design principle. The third is control access on a need-to-know basis, least privilege. And the fourth is inspect and log all that traffic to make sure bad stuff isn't happening. And those four design principles, if you do design thinking and systems thinking, you end up in zero trust land. Yeah, and it's the same like we said we've done in the past with firewalls, right? Where, you know, in the old days... You know, we tur- we get a firewall, and we leave everything on, and then we close it as we need it. Where nowadays we're getting firewalls with everything off and being smarter to open it as we need it, right? We're doing the complete opposite of what we used to do, and it's it's you know it's it's working a lot better in that aspect than it used to, obviously. I mean, we all know that when you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you never win at Whack a Mole. No one, no one has ever won a game of Whack a Mole, where all the moles are gone. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's quit playing it. So is there any motion that you're aware of in software development tooling? I mean, beyond the generic motions like DevOps and DevSecOps, which is surely helpful potentially here, um, to remove the job of 
worrying about this stuff from the developer's shoulders? Or are we actually looking at an opposite motion where development, software development has been too compartmentalized and too professionalized in and of itself and that people aren't aware enough of the business around them to actually reliably be able to write secure applications for that business? Well, I'll, let me give my take on it and then I'll let Jason pick that up. Uh, because first of all, it's phenomenally difficult to write secure applications because you think you've done it securely. And then years later, you find out that there was something that's been exploited. Log4j is a great example of a piece of software that for years, no one thought was insecure. And then suddenly there's a vulnerability there and it's devastating. But that was just because no one had figured out how to exploit it. So, so you, you do the best you can when you're in software. That's the first thing. The second thing is software is about speed. And the incentives are to make it go fast. I always joke that, that the DevOps people are the Ricky Bobbies of cybersecurity, right? They just want to go fast. Shake and bake. I got a cougar sitting next to me. Uh, and, and that's fine. We're here to provide the guardrails. So there, it's about the way that we, you know, the, the driver drives fast, but the, the racetrack itself has guardrails and systems and roll cages and all those things to protect the driver so that the driver can go as fast as possible. And I think that that's what we do if we're going to take that analogy to its most ridiculous end. And then... There has to be some in new incentives from the business, you know, like like this company that I talked about where the where an executive vice president opened up the S3 bucket for everybody. Uh, that's a bad set of incentives. I know another company talking to 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 this company and talking to them about what they do for security in software. And the head of that whole thing said, ah, we really don't do anything because we're judged on how many releases we do a day, right? In in Agile. And so we can't think about security. I said, well, what happens if there is a, a, a data breach because of something you did? He said, yeah, well, I'm only going to be here for six to 18 months. I'll be long gone before anybody discovers that. And, and so, you know, I don't really care because that's not my job. And in fact, this company, the person I was talking to, was part of uh, that company was part of one of the most massive data breaches we've ever had. And I knew four or five years before that it was coming because of that particular attitude that, yeah, I'm not going to even focus on it because I'll be long gone before it happens. Yeah, we see, I see that a lot. That's why, you know, again, I go back to the business model, like we just talked about where, I, you know, when it comes to applications, especially, I always tell, you know, advise people that they should get security involved as soon as they can in application development, right? If you've got an app, a website, anything that your company is doing, right, your goal should be to add security up front because, one, obviously, it helps bring it to the table faster and get everything addressed. And people don't realize the money it can also save because a lot of people, they see the app, they want to get it out. To make money, they want to get it moving, and you know, so they don't really think about security. But then, then they'll come back to you when the app needs security, and they're like, "Oh my God, I have to spend this much now to get it secure." And I'm like, "Well, yes, but also, but if you would have brought us in in the beginning, by the way, I could have said you at least maybe half of that possibly, because I could have integrated it while you were doing it, so we could have done two things at one time and been successful, right?" But and we just don't see that a lot, and that's that's a big thing that I wish we could get more into is just bring security to the table at the beginning and start discussing it, and it you'd see a world of difference in things. In actual software development process, does that mean having a conversation with a security specialist every time you want to add a feature? I would have them in the room, right? I mean, that's just the thing is like, it's it's not costing you anything to have the person in the room getting their opinion and feedback, and then addressing it right. White, you know, take you know, doing the white uh, notes on it, doing whatever you need to do to understand it. I mean, it might not be feasible. It might be too much, whatever. But at least you know, right? That's the that's the whole concept is you under you get to talk to them, you get to understand it instead of having the conversation later. So I've always recommend that if you can have a security person in the room to at least hear it out. Get their feedback on it, 
you know, and take it with a grain of salt or whatever you want to do with it, but at least hear them out. Yeah, because I'll, I'll just say real quick, too, one thing that I've learned with companies is actually some companies actually do a lot more security than they even know. They just don't know they're even doing it. They don't have the conversations, and the teams are just so spread out or just, you know, different and answer different. They don't even realize they're even doing a lot of it. And I, I see that a lot. I'm like, I'll go through audits, and I'm like, you know you do that, right? And they're like, we do? And I'm like, well, yeah, this, that's what this team over here does, by the way. So that's part of it, too. I think is it, like, again, that learn the business, make sure they – and see what they do because, again, it's not as hard because I've seen so many companies that actually would – you know, they'd ace an audit. They just don't realize they would do that because they don't have it they – don't, they don't take the time to put it all together and build a kit out of the process. That's actually very interesting. I mean, the idea that – that compliance, you know, actually helps security in that direction rather than the reverse. Well, it does because a, a lot of a lot of sec, a lot of engineers are doing things like lease privileges, a lot of the stuff that they're doing, but they're not security engineers, so they don't even realize they're doing security. I mean, I, I see it all the time when I do, like I said, audit interviews and stuff, and they're like, "I'm like, will you do this?" Well, yeah, that's what we do, and I'm like, "Well, that's that's part of the security audit." And they're like, "Oh, I do security." I'm like, "You do," you know. <laughs> It's just so funny when you when you talk to people about it because they just they don't realize it because they're in their in a lot of people's minds they feel that they need the security title or they need you know to be called that in order to do security and I'm like you don't you you do it as part of your daily activity you just don't realize it and then well, again when you put it all together I'm like well you pass your audit because you're actually doing everything you just did not realize it is there something that we can leave people with that will help them uh, take the next step, whatever that is. I'm sure some of the folks uh, attending here are uh, well on their way towards trying to implement Z Zero Trust. Uh, maybe uh, they're one of the few entirely successful uh, project leaders. Others are really probably just starting down that road now. Um, what can we say that will lighten their burdens uh, most expeditiously? Um, from my side, I would say, you know, again, as you learn the business, but take your time. Don't freak out. You know, don't overthink it. Just, you know, build it into a process, into a think chart, you know, and just take it little steps at a time. And as you do that, you'll you you not only grow zero trust, but you grow security as a whole for your company because you're gonna gain all that knowledge and everything. And it's to me it's just it's just easier to take those little small steps and you'll be successful. Don't Again, like John's always said, I mean, just don't, you know, don't freak out, slow down, take a breath, right? So this is really achievable. I mean, you can, you can walk into a situation and just begin the process of discovery and understanding, ask those Kipling method questions that, that uh, people like George Finney, for example, you know, have assembled in handy charts. <laughs> for us so we don't forget them, right? Who, what, when, where, why, how? Or or, or just taking charts that I've given George Finney. So. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> we can um, go that route can't, can't, give, can't give George too much <laughs> more credit than he, than he deserves. It's a great book, but... Uh, yeah. You know, the and the thing here, right, is most people think it's going to be hard and it's not. I've had, I remember one client said, we argued about zero trust longer than it took us to do our first zero trust thing. Uh, those of us who do it, it's experiential. If, if you're hearing about it academically, it probably sounds really, really complex. I read stuff and I go, wow, wow, I, I, I would never want to do that. And luckily I don't have to because I know the right way. So uh, look, at, look at, at that, right? It's a simple process, really, when you break it down in these small, bite-sized, manageable chunks. You do it per protect surface. It becomes incremental, one protect surface at a time. It's iterative, one protect surface after another. And it's non-disruptive. The most you can screw up is one protect surface. That's why the protect surface is so important. And then you can write those granular Kipling method policies uh, that, that we talk about in the NSTAC report and that George does such a good job of telling the story of the Zero Trust journey uh, through Project Zero Trust. You know, that started, that whole novel started on my couch and when and uh, we we started talking through it, and so it's so cool to see somebody with that level of creativity turn it into a story, uh, as opposed to a process. And, but the fact that you could write a novel like that just shows you 
that this is not that complicated and don't be fearful of it and start somewhere. Everybody's worried about starting after they've gotten everything else perfected. Wherever you start is okay. It doesn't matter. Just start somewhere. The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And if you spend years deciding where's my first step, all you're going to do is turn around in circles. That makes enormous sense. Uh, anyway, uh, we are, I believe, at time. I'd like to thank both of you very much for an inspiring conversation and uh, and and for all this instruction. Uh, to our audience, we are going to post some helpful links to the NSAC report and other materials uh, available online uh, in our own repositories and uh, on the broader internet that can help uh, people make sense of what they've heard here today, maybe a little more. And uh, again, thank you, J John Kindervog and uh, Jason James for, uh, for a, a, a great deal of useful education.